Welcome to International Gospel Center on this, in this wonderful service. Welcome to his presence. Welcome you by video. In the name of Jesus, may his power be upon you tonight as we minister his word. Hold up your hand and say, Jesus. Jesus. And you do it to you that are watching. I accept you tonight. I, accept you tonight. I receive you, I receive in, you. Your power, in your power, in your glory, in your, glory. In your presence, in, your presence. In, me, in me, to bless me, bless me. So, that I can be a blessing. so that I can be a blessing. In the name of Jesus who died for me, that I might have this life that's worth giving. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Tonight, my subject, appointed and anointed for action, number four. Hallelujah. Based on the first sentence in the book of Acts, the first sentence, that beautiful sentence that is the connection between the, the, uh, <clears throat> the ministry of Jesus in the body of the man from Nazareth and the ministry of Jesus in the body called, say, me. Is that right? And this one sentence that is the bridge that covers so many basics in this great revelation that we walk in, which we call salvation. Something hidden, concealed, not known from generation to generation and kings and great People long to understand but never could, but has been revealed to us. Think of that. To us in this time, hallelujah for Paul and the revelation that's been now unveiled to us, made clear to us so that we could assimilate it and become impregnated with it. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Jesus, alive in the believer, continuing to do what he began to do and teach in the Gospels, and now continues it through me. Hallelujah. What a masterful unfolding this is. I've told you that there are seven very big principles that we will study in the course of the coming times that I minister to you. And they, the first letter of each of these principles form what I suppose we call an acrostic, which spells miracle. And it is all a miracle. It's a miracle how we got it, it's a miracle how it was provided, and it's a miracle how we share it. And it produces miracles. It is a miracle life. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. Miracle, M, maturity. I, inspiration. R, response. A, action. C, credibility. L, legality. E, experience. Tonight, number four on action. Appointed and anointed for action. Action. You remember my poem? One for each of these. I won't read them all. Just that, that one about action. The fourth great key in miracle to help me make Christ known is A. It stands for action. By deeds, his seeds are sown. Focus on the phrase within this long sentence. He, Jesus, through the Holy Ghost, gave commandment to the apostles whom he had chosen. 
He commanded them to do something. That's, an, that's, a, that's a word that implies action. He commanded it to the apostles. That is a word that implies action because an apostle is a sent one. That's what you are. Say, that's what I am. That's what I am. Whom he had chosen. Chosen is an action word. By deeds, his seeds are sown. As a prep for our message tonight, I felt impressed to go over to Romans chapter 8 to read a little bit. And I have to admit, I'm going to try, and, I'm going to, try to get back now here at a starting point. But if we don't get back, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> there are some things that are oh so beautiful that I want to help you catch on to. But back to my point, appointed and anointed for action. Romans 8. And let's turn to verse, uh, start at verse 28. And I want, I want to read you some good stuff there. <clears throat> we know the context of this is so beautiful. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. The called. Say, I'm one of the called. I'm one of the called. <clears throat> that means appointment. <clears throat> I'm called. Say, I'm called. I'm called. Who is he writing this to? All of his other letters were written to churches, communities that he had helped form. Romans is the only one that's written to a congregation that he had, to a, a community that he had nothing to do with forming. So in Romans, that's why it's called, it's the only epistle that's called the gospel according to Paul. Did you know that? Many of the writers, you know, just in a quote unquote way of referring to the book of Romans, they refer to the book of Romans as the gospel according to Rome. Why? Because Romans is the only letter that Paul wrote that just concerns the gospel. Paul did not, to the Romans, write in his letter all of the things that he set in straight because of local cultures. He's not dealing with those things in Romans. He hasn't been there. He don't know the problems at Rome, so he just writes the gospel. Paul was such a student knew the scriptures and missed it all. Paul knew all of the scriptures throughout, throughout the prophets that foretold that this light would break out among the Gentiles and they would all come to it. Paul says to himself, how have I missed that? How could I have? He must have thought about those 30 years after Christ. All that time, he had missed. While other people were believing on him, he was out trying to kill them. And he was the one that knew the scriptures. How could he make such a fool mistake? Have you ever thought that way? How could I have missed it? How could I have missed Jesus? How could I have missed the truth? How could I have been so stupid? How could I have been so foolish? How could I have wasted so much of my life? I heard it when I was a boy. I heard it when I was a, when I was a girl. Or my mama or my daddy followed Jesus. I didn't. How could I have missed it? I mean, it's... It's a relative feeling to Paul's. Then I think he thinks about them. They were the ones who crucified this Jesus. Paul being glad they did when they did. 
But later, being converted, finding out that Jesus is alive again, Paul, of course, falls in love with Jesus. Jesus becomes his Lord and Master. And Paul then takes on a passion to let these people all, the Jews first, and then the Greeks, the, Jew, the Gentiles, let them know that this Jesus is the Savior of the world, the one predicted by all the prophets that would come. And Paul's thinking about this. And he's concerned about these Romans. And he says, I can just see him pondering. He says, you know, isn't it something? They're like me. They killed him. They delighted to kill him. They gambled over his garment. They were delighted when they got rid of that rebel. Things would settle down then. And my, how I thought they would settle down. What a wonderful thing I thought it was. The Romans did it, but I was so glad they did it. Roman, Paul has a kindred thinking with them. And I think maybe he begins to weep. He says, how could the grace of God be given to me like it was that I would come to have this revelation? Look how wicked I was. I knew all the scriptures. I backhanded them all. I, I mean, I ignored them all. I was on a campaign to destroy this Jesus. How could the grace of God come to me like it did? In a vision. Why would God have sent that light to me? I wasn't the only one out trying to round up the Christians for Nero. Why me? How could I have been so fortunate? But the light shined to me. Then you know over in Galatians, he figures it out. He says, I realize now that, that before I was separated from my mother's womb, God had called me to reveal his son in me. Never forget that. That's what we're called for. But Paul is thinking with such, such, what would you say? Such reflection, such depth of compassion. These people are like I was. True, I was a Jew. I was doing it for holy reasons. They were doing it for legal reasons, for political reasons, because they figured he was a politician bringing in a new kingdom. Sooner or later, was going to bring up an uprising, and we'd have to send help over an armada of ships and, and a bunch of uh, soldiers and, and cavalrymen to go over and help our forces there because it's spreading so fast over there, away across there. You know, it's the difference from Italy across to Syria. That's a long ways back then when you had sailboats. And that Paul's thinking, I know why they were upset. And they were trying to decimate this bunch of rebels because sooner or later they were sure to rise up. So true, they were, they were Romans, they were Gentiles. They killed him because they were glad he was dead because of political reasons. But me, I was just as glad he was dead because of religious reasons. Which bigotry was wrong, was worse their political bigotry or my religious bigotry. And I thought I knew God. But God reached me and loved me. My God, how could you do that to me? I was the worst of all of them. Can it be that you knew I thought I was serving you? But what about these poor Romans? Dumb, ignorant, Pagans, worshipers of heathen gods, they didn't do it to serve you. They did it in darkness. They don't even have hope. I have hope. I know the scriptures. I've found the revelation. I know I walk with God, but the Romans, the head of government, they're still on a campaign. They're still killing them. They're still arresting them. I got to go to Rome. I got to get to the top of this thing. Are you catching on? Are you seeing what I'm talking about? 
Oh, may God take this and seed in you a passion for your uncle or your aunt or your relatives or your neighbors that don't, don't know anything about Christ, have no hope, do what they do in ignorance, and you setting with the truth. And all you need to do is make a little journey, not those, those thousands of miles in a sailboat, but in a nice automobile or pick up a nice telephone and you can give them the message. But they're dying, worshiping other gods and have no hope. Hope, and there's no way for them. They're outside of the covenant of God. And, but they're, they're in reach of you. And all you've got to do is touch them. And what you've got can heal anything. The power that's in you is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. When you disseminate that and spread that out, you can do anything, baby. Oh, go to Rome. Even if they kill you doing it, go to Rome because they've got to hear the message. Are you hearing me? I want every one of you to promise me you'll go home tonight and read the first verses, 10 or 12 verses, first 16 verses of the book of Romans, and it'll have a different light to you than it ever had in your life. And you will then see the book of Romans. That sets the stage for it. Then it goes through. Now, here's the point I want to make. And it looks like I'm not going to get back to that. But if I can give you an overview that will provoke you to study, I will have, I will have achieved a worthy goal, won't I? And sometimes, the reason I'm talking to you this, I'm trying to make you think. We read the Bible and don't think. we got to think. The Bible is for now. It's not a holy book of history for the yesterday that deals with customs and rituals and we are regimented to think what we want, what we're supposed to think about every scripture. No! We've got to open it and read and listen and think about its relativity to our day. Otherwise, we're just using it as a, as a crutch to go to heaven on. It doesn't have any, rap, any rapport with our everyday lifestyle. And that's where we miss it. That's what produces bigotry in religion. Isn't that right? Am I helping you? And now, now that first, it opens up so beautiful. <clears throat> Paul, a servant of Jesus, writing those folks up there that have been converted, and oh, he's wanting to help the self-esteem of those that maybe have just been converted or coming in. Think about these Romans. They carry this cloud on them all the time. They were the ones, their government crucified Jesus. Put yourself in their shape. Now, especially when you've got all this Christian world, you've got to put it back in its context. They don't like that Roman government anyway. And so they're running them down all the time. I mean, they're, 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 they're working on them all the time. Raising up groups here and there and voices here and there said, don't obey them, break their law. They're no good. They're not of God. Paul has to write and say, wait, they're the ministers of God too. That's why a lot of his writing about obeying the laws of the land because these Christians over here, they don't like that Roman government way off over there across the sea sending their, their regiments to control us and keep us in line, arresting our people, taking them off to jail, feeding them to the lions. Would you like them if you had a government like that? You'd get mad if they raised the taxes. No hide off of your back. They're not taking anyone to jail. They're not, they're not crucifying, any, crucifying anybody. They're not hanging a bunch of your brothers and sisters on poles and lighting them to give light in the city for the night to have a drunken brawl and dance party by the light of your brothers and sisters burning. How would you feel about that kind of a government? You'd work on them, wouldn't you? Yeah, bet you you would. Think, think. See, we think Bible holy. Think. It applies to today. And Paul has a compassion to make these Roman people feel welcome too. Isn't it beautiful that the real agape love loves the worst and gives it value by virtue of its love? Our only value exists in the fact that God loves us. 
Because when agape love loves, it elevates the thing loved to its level. You can't love agape love and treat them as an underdog. It's impossible. And the agape love in Paul is reaching out to this great nation of people over here that if he can just get into the headquarters town and really in reinforce this Christian message and get it across in its simplicity and in its beauty, then he says we'll have a real good thing going and Jesus will have a strong, strong bunch of followers that'll spread everywhere because Rome is the capital. They can go anywhere from Rome. Hallelujah. And so he, so he writes to them and he says, uh, he says I'm, I'm, I'm separated unto the gospel of God uh, concerning uh, according to the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. That, that's me, he says. He lays that out right quick. He says, you might not know about it, but that, 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 that's, that's where I get all what I am concerning our, uh, his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, declared to be the son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead, by whom we've received grace and apostleship, among whom are, verse 6, are you also the called? of Jesus Christ. Now listen to those tender words. He's built up a real story about himself and the grace of God that's given him and the apostleship and the wonder of the revelation of Jesus. But he says, Romans, you are among the called of God too. What? Romans, among the called of God? God? Jehovah? The real God? The big God, Romans, you among the called of God. Now it's very tough for we Americans to project ourselves to, to the wonder of those words. But think of the underdog, of the outcast. I don't want to compare the Romans to, to drunkards and prostitutes, but in the sense of them being outcast, being considered the scum, being considered the no goods, being considered the up and outers or the out of reachers, the ones that are contemptible to the gospel. All that in that sense, that's what we're talking about. You are among the call. See, that's our message to everybody. The lowest of the low, the farthest of the farther one, the one that doesn't have any attention attachment, whatever to the gospel, no regard for it, no desire for it, never been around it, we come and smile and say what we've got from God is powerful and glorious. We're called, oh, we're called, chosen of God, and you are too. Among whom you are the called, to all that be at Rome, beloved of God. What? To these kind of people that are arresting them all over the country? Now I know he's talking to believers, but don't forget it, he's talking to the Roman people too. We hem it in and say it to the believers, you know, just to the holy people, because we in religion always do that. We hem everything in for us and ours. I'm trying to pry your mind loose from that to see Romans, crucifiers, rejectors, pagans, outcasts, the no goods, the resisted ones, the people that impose terrible things on us, the unjust ones, the cruel ones. Are you getting it? Beloved of God, to them, beloved of God, you're among the called, too. You can have anything I got. I got something to talk to you about. He says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, 
That's his call to everybody. He calls us all to be saints. If he calls us to be saved, he calls us to be saints. But see, we in religion, we slice that off. That's for the little band of Christians or the big band of Christians in Rome. And they are so deep and profound that they are called to be saints like all the holy people we know with halos. No, no, no. Don't th think, think, think. It's a people. The people, a nation. You ever think about Japan? Daisy and I groan for Japan. We've wanted to give a life to Japan because of it's a great nation. Paul must have felt that way about Rome. The Romans, such a great people. Oh, they could do so much for God if I could get the gospel to them. And he says, and he writes this beautiful message, tells them how wonderful it is. You're called too. So he said, verse 15, has, he says, in verse 14, I'm a debtor to everybody. Said, people, people think because I'm a Jew, I just run around like, all, like so many of the Jews have always done, run around among their own tribes, their own people, and keep everything for themselves and teach the word of God and the prophets and all this holy stuff and good stuff we've got just to our people. But he says, I'm a debtor to everybody. The Greeks, the barbarians, everybody, everybody. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? We're not just messengers to the holy folks. We, our mission is to the Greeks. 14, barbarians, the wise, the unwise, everybody. So, he says, as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you too who are at Rome because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's a power of God and a salvation to everyone that believes. Everyone over here, every one of you, everyone up there, spread it among your people. Oh, you Romans, tell it to all your uncles and aunts and your families. Everybody who will believe this gospel can be saved because the gospel is the power of God. I've got good news for you, he says. So back over here to Romans 8, where I was trying to start with my script, with my text. He said, he said uh, and, and we know that all things work together for them who love God, them who are the called, according to his purpose, still talking to these beautiful people. And then he lists this bunch, this stuff, and this was what inspired me and took all my time tonight. <laughs> Look at this lineup, for whom he did foreknow. And he had al already been talking to them about knowing them and knowing himself. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, verse 30. Whom he called, them he also justified. Look what a lineup he's given to these people, these brutish people. I know he's talking to the church too. They're believers, but he's telling them to tell everybody this. Whom he, whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. So he said, what are we going to say to all this? I don't care whether you're Roman or whether you're, whether you're Galilean. If God be for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. Romans, I'm coming to you. And I got a message for you. And then here was what I said all that for. I said all that to say, if you'll go from there on through, well, or you can back up from chapter 1, but go right through, you'll find the book of Romans is Paul's teaching about how everybody can be in the body of Christ. Everybody can be hooked up with the true vine. Everybody can be a part of this Jesus life, this resurrection, quickening power that God has shown in Jesus by raising him from the dead and giving it back to us. And we got it. And everybody, regardless of their tribe, of their ancestral roots, regardless of their genealogy, it doesn't make any difference what nation they're from. Everybody can have this blessing. 
And he goes back and tells about, about Abraham and about Sarah and argues his points all the way through and about conversion and what it means. And he, his argument all goes on through and, and it becomes greater and greater and greater and culminates over in, in Romans chapter 10 where in verse 12 there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over, is, over all is rich to all that call upon him. For whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And said how they're gonna how they're gonna call if they don't believe, and how they're gonna believe they haven't heard, and how you're gonna hear if someone don't don't preach, and how you're gonna preach if someone don't send them. In other words, he's he he's talking about all that, and then he says, uh, Faith can only come by hearing. You got to hear this before you can know this. And that's why I'm ready to come and tell you. And thank God others have come and told you. And that's our mission to go and tell you. And then he goes on. And in and, and, and 11, he keeps on talking. He says in verse 11, salvation is come to the Gentiles. Verse 13, I am an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. And he goes right on through. And then he comes to chapter 12. And there he finally makes his point. Took him almost as long as it did me tonight. See? <laughs> when he got to 12, he made his point. All of, the re all of the first 11 chapters of Romans is the preview to set up the case so that Paul could make a simple point for believers in Jesus Christ. What's the point? The point is... You've got this life, let it apply in your everyday life and rapport with people. Now, that brings me back to my starting point. We are appointed, we are anointed for action. Now, back again, let me say this again. The first 11 chapters are setting up the argument all of the truth, the blessed good news, the unfolding beautiful drama that anybody, heretic or not heretic, good or bad, pagan or religious, no matter who can be saved and his arguments are conclusive. The gospel according to Paul first 11 chapters. The gospel. Buddy, it is there. Lady, it is there. All of it. So, therefore, chapter 12. Here we go. So, therefore, I beseech you, take it and do something practical with it. And chapter 12, 13, 14, and a little bit of 15, it's been said that if there was no other Bible for us, those would be sufficient if we went by them. Paul then takes the Romans and he puts everything in there. And it's all the Christian lifestyle. How you do in your rapport with people. How you relate to people. How you relate to your government. How you relate to each other. How, how your lifestyle is, how your comportment is, how your attitude is in business. And it's in little short sentences. Remember what it said, you young Christians, never forget this. Read Romans 12, 13, 14, about half of 15. It's little short sentences. And it's just bang, 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 in terms of bang, 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 bang. Four chapters of little short sentences that, that, that touches Practically every aspect of Christian life. And the whole idea is this revelation of Jesus is not something to make us quiver in the sanctuary. But it's a knowledge that gives us faith to recognize we are the among the called of God for His purpose to go out and change our world by being honest and beautiful and witnessing and sharing 
and being true and respecting government and helping poor people and being kind to people and living right and being upright. It's a daily lifestyle that lasts from Monday to Saturday night. Glory to God. We come to church on Sunday. We get blessed. We go out there and we minister. Sunday, Romans 1 through 11. <laughs> Get your revelation. Then Monday, go to Romans 12, 13, 14, 15. And go out there and live. But in the church today, like I said the other day, it isn't done that way. You know, we, we come to church to get a lift, to get holier and spiritualer. And in some way, we have some kind of a prayer or conclusion that gives us a zing. And then we flip that baby off and we're ready to get back to life as normal. No, we don't all do that, do we? I don't, do you? Say, I don't. I don't. Say, Monday's coming. Monday's coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My ministry is coming. You ain't seen nothing till Monday. Hallelujah. That's my ministry. Glory to God. Have I done anything for you tonight? I, thank you. I needed that. I've shared insight with you. You know, there, there's no gift greater than to be able to compose a person's mind and attitude toward the Bible. To where you can read it then with a new viewpoint, with a fresh viewpoint, and understand, oh, now it'll make sense for me. And that's a big gift for a Sunday night service. If I can do that to the, what's considered probably the most profound book in the New Testament, the book of Romans. Now you'll read it and you'll find that from Romans, after a few verses when Paul sets up his case and tells him why he's coming, then he goes right down to the bottom of how mean people are without God, how no good they are. Some of, some of the meanest statements in the Bible are there. I mean, it really goes down to the bottom of what, a, what, a, what, what, what the unconverted nature can be. And then Paul starts working on it with it using as an, as an analogy the Romans and starts bringing them out. And I, I have such compassion when I see him regarding these people that have this awful ghost in their closet. They killed the Son of God. But Paul thinks to himself, no worse than the ghost in my closet. I wanted him killed, just for different reasons. But Paul could, could have rapport with him. And I often think, if Paul, when he thought back about all the wrong things that he had done, maybe if he could go down there and help some of the Romans at the top of the government discover this Jesus, maybe it would pay a little bit. If he could go to the top, maybe he could, maybe, maybe it would, maybe it would, he'd feel a little bit better thinking, well, at least... I'm repaying a little of my debt. I'm not saying Paul's trying to pay it for his salvation. That's not my point. I'm saying that purely a psychological point with him. Thinking, he's human. He wasn't a God. He was a human like you and me. We get converted, don't we? Wonderfully converted. How many closets, how many ghosts are back there in your closet? But we always, one way or another, we want to bring dignity to our lives and realize we've done something for our Lord because we did so much against him. And I, I have compassion for Paul thinking about this. If I can get over there to Rome and get the light among those precious people and lift them out of their, out of their, their adoring pagan gods, they don't dream that we Christians, that our Christ would welcome them. They don't dream that. They're lost in their own religion. They're worshiping the emperor, offering sacrifices to him. If I can just show them the Jesus they killed is the Savior. And he wants to put out his arms and love them and say, my best news 
is for you too. I forgive you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, they say, isn't it there in one of the catacombs of Rome where so many of the Christians, you know, they lost their lives and there where they have uh, uncovered that beautiful scratching or painting or however they did it about the, the, the Roman hordes, you know, that dominated the Christians. But it showed the Christians setting out in sailboats toward Rome saying something about Jesus said, go, we went. In other words, to their persecutors, to the ones that killed them, to the ones that were, were arresting their wives and their, 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 their children and killing them. There in that catacomb, that painting, we went. We went with agape love to the very people that are trying to tear us down. It's a beautiful story. Hallelujah. And if, it doesn't, if that doesn't apply to us today, we're not hooked up right. But it does apply, don't it, when we're reminded of it. Make, make, that's, that's our purpose. We're appointed and we're anointed. And I'll take up right here and go again. I'm not near through this. Not near through this. I haven't showed you yet why you are appointed and why you are anointed. Why Jesus was appointed and why he was anointed. I'm heading for it. It's coming. Glory to God. But, but tonight, I wanted to get this to you so that you could have a compassion for people. People. Outside of our own ranks. Hallelujah. I want tonight, I want to bless you that have watched by, by video. In the name of Jesus, may this message come to you and spark and seed in you your purpose, your calling to talk about Jesus to someone else and share him. Take him right now. In Jesus' name, I bless you. I bless you by the power that raised up Jesus from the dead. I bless you. May the quickening power of the Holy Ghost come in you, quicken you, heal you. Save you if you're not saved. Change you. Give you compassion for people. And make you his messenger. That's your purpose. That's your calling. Hallelujah. God bless you. We love you. Write and tell us what God does for you. Praise the name of the Lord.